Do you believe that Christianity is true? I would guess that in a group of a hundred or so people, even in a church where the Bible is presented every week, I'm fairly sure that there are some of you who really aren't convinced. And I want to say, you are so welcome here. I am just so happy to know that people who are questioning the Christian faith are investigating it. And I, I hope that you sense that this is a judgment-free environment in which for you to make up your mind. But I also know that most of you probably do believe that Christianity is true, and I have a question. A question for all of you is simply, why do you believe that Christianity is true? That's a question that everyone who calls himself a Christian ought to be able to answer. And I'm going to have one short testimony of a member of our welcome team who's going to answer this question, and then I'm going to briefly answer it before we start talking about the main subject of the morning, which is stewardship. And it'll all kind of work together, guaranteed. So Sally, please come up. Sally Sean is a member of our welcome team. Uh, they get here early and set up all the chairs and the signs and the flags and all that stuff, and then they stay late and they put it all away. So Sally's been part of this crew for, for two years now, and uh, I asked her to come and simply answer the question, why do I believe Christianity is true? Pastor Doug's been really pouring into my life to help me, and so I, I wrote it out. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for my sins because he answered my prayers when I asked him to help me believe. I had grown up in the church and had prayed the sinner's prayer, asking God to forgive me and live in me when I was younger. Uh, middle school, we went to a lot of retreats. And that was easy to do because as a child, when I have conflicts with my parents, I felt like a sinner. But at the age of 16, um, I began to seek God on my own, and I wanted to pray. I asked God to help me see him. Otherwise, how could I believe? I read the verse, ask and you shall receive Seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open to you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. And I prayed that verse over and over. And I said, God, you told me to ask and I'm seeking. Please help me to believe. And um, I uh, was reading the Bible and um, I said, can you please let me in? He kept his promise. I asked and I received, I sought and I found. During the course of those earnest prayers, I felt an assurance that God is real, and I didn't have any doubts. I think that was the Holy Spirit giving me faith. My belief was also shaped by seeing the life of my youth pastor, David. He was the one who inspired me to read the Bible daily. He ha we had two youth pastors before him, but David was humble, compassionate, and kind. Middle school and high school kids can be wise guys and obnoxious, but when they were that way toward him, David never came back with a smart answer. He just smiled and didn't reply. He loved God so much. He started a church in the inner city of Staten Island where there were gangs and drugs. His youth group kids robbed his house and stole $7,000 that he'd been saving for a down payment for his wedding. But he was never bitter. He never said anything about feeling disappointed or betrayed. He talked instead of God's great love and goodness. That same week, he had been given an old van. He'd been looking for a car to carry his equipment because he was a tree cutter. He learned that the worth of that van was $7,000. He pointed out that hurtful things will happen to us, but God is looking out for us. He cares for us. In my searching, I asked God, is David just a special person? And the answer I received was, there is none who is righteous, not even one. Romans 3.10. And there is only one who is good. Matthew 19.17. David isn't a good person, according to God. He's a grateful person who knows God. He's an example of a life that loves God. He loves God unconditionally because God loves him that way. God had answered my prayer and kept his promise by showing himself to me in the form of people who love him. Only God can transform a life. No one is good. 
and he continues to do this for me. I see many people at Valley Simsbury who love God and strive to live and love like him, and many have personally been like Jesus toward me. This is why I believe, because I've experienced the goodness of God. So, why do I believe? You say, well, you're a pastor. You're so old, you've probably been a pastor like forever. And I've been a pastor a long time, but being a pastor didn't make me a believer. You know, it, it really should work the opposite. You're a believer first, then you become a pastor. And that was what happened to me. And I'll tell you a little more about that story but I'm going to connect it to my financial life. Now, right away, I want you to know I've been working for nonprofits all my life. And in my house growing up, my dad didn't say, hey, make as much money as you can, get as much stuff as you can. It just wasn't that kind of environment because my folks were raised in the Great Depression. And they, you just didn't think that way when you were a teenager in 1933. So that's the uh, journey I began on, and I'm going to tell you how my financial commitments and the commitments of Christine and myself in finances have become a building block of our faith. Now, Mark and I are teaming up, me this week, Mark next week, to talk about what we've been entrusted with and the fact that the Bible tells us that we don't own anything that we have. It's just been entrusted to us. And our responsibility is to become good stewards of whatever God gives to us. So that's the broader idea. But I sought out 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 because there are two tremendous chapters about giving. And I had my wife read them because... She's as much a part of the story part of my sermon as I am. We've been married, whoa, way over 50 years, and uh, we've been connecting on finances be since before that time. I'll describe that a little later. But uh, the passage tells us right away in verse 5, it, it's hardly even getting going, and Paul says that there's a foundation for giving. And that foundation is to give yourself first to the Lord. Give yourself first to the Lord. Now, the context of this is that Paul is writing the church at Corinth. He's writing for the second time. And initially, he had exhorted them to give to help the Jerusalem believers. Jerusalem is a long way from Corinth, but, but those Christians in Jerusalem were hurting. They were hurting economically. They were being persecuted. They really needed outside financial help. And so Paul calls on the Corinthians to do that. And at first they get off to a pretty good start, and then they, for whatever reason, sort of lose interest. Now, you've got to understand that Corinth was a vibrant city. It was full of capable people. Frankly, it had a lot of similarities to our own Farmington Valley. There are so many capable people here. There are so, there's so much capacity in the folks who live in Simsbury and Canton and, and so forth. That's the way Corinth was. And to sort of get the attention of these well-endowed folks, Paul uses the illustration and the example of the Macedonians. Now, Macedonia doesn't mean much to us. But when you think of Macedonia in terms of economic terms, think of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Okay, I, I bear no ill will towards Bridgeport. But I did work just outside that city for a good long time at another church. And I will tell you, Bridgeport was a lot better known for its financial problems than it was for its financial opportunities. That's just the way it was. And so just... If you don't want to think about Bridgeport, think about some other place that just doesn't have a lot going for it economically. And that was Macedonia. And Paul says to the Corinthians, 
who have all kinds of capacity, he says, look, you guys are sort of losing it on giving to the Jerusalem folks, and you need to look up, look up to this body of believers in Macedonia because they are knocking it out of the park in what they're doing to help the Jerusalem believers. And he tells them, if you're going to give financially, the first thing you need to check out is what is your own commitment to the Lord? How much do you love Jesus? How convinced are you that Christianity is what you want to live for? That's the first step, he says, if you're going to be a good giver. He says the Macedonians gave themselves first to God and then to the financial need of the Jerusalem believers. Now, I'm going to tell you that uh, my experience in giving began when I was a teenager. So I received Christ in the fifth grade. I committed my life to the Lord in sort of a formal way in the 10th grade. This is way back. But they had this thing called dedicate your life to the Lord. And they encouraged us to do that when I went to this Christian camp. And that's exactly what I did. So literally a couple of months after, I said, God, anything you want, I'm good for it. Right after I said that, uh, within six months, I was sitting in my church service. I went to this church and they had this system where you were supposed to give a pledge of money to help them plan their finances. Not too unreasonable. And as they made this exhortation, I really knew they weren't talking to me. I was a teenager. I, I didn't have a job. Uh, I was an athlete, and athletes didn't have any time to go work at Burger King and so forth. So I knew they weren't talking to me, but yet I'm part of this church, I'm thinking. I'm benefiting from this church. I love the youth group. So I thought I really should give something. So I prayed about it, and I think I'm going to give $5 a week. $5 a week. That's not a lot of money, but frankly, I had very little money. Uh, my grandfather was great. Uh, every week or two, we'd have a family gathering. He'd always give me a big smile and give me a couple of bucks, like a couple of bucks, two bucks, maybe three. And that was my income when I made this commitment. But, you know, two surprising things happened shortly after I made this $5 a week commitment. First of all, my grandpa, for no reason known to me, started giving me $5 when we got together. Now, my grandfather didn't know about my pledge. He was a good guy, but, you know, he didn't get into my religious life. And then something else happened. People started calling me and saying, hey, Doug, if you've got a few minutes here or there, a couple hours here or there, we need our lawn mowed, or I need my porch painted, or I need some cleanup in the garden. So all of a sudden, I was like this independent, entrepreneurial kind of guy. And I could fit in those jobs in between the times when I played my sports and had my games and all of that. How did that happen? Was I lucky? I wasn't lucky. I was receiving the grace of God in response to that promise that I made. And you know, all of a sudden, that idea of giving yourself to the Lord, it, it began to have some really practical meaning. And that was the beginning, the beginning of my truly believing that what God said in his word was true. I didn't make that declaration at that moment, but that was the start of a pattern that I've never escaped ever since. Now, Paul goes on and makes another comment to the Corinthians. He says that Jesus sets the giving standard, but it's not the same for everybody. This is a familiar verse. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, 
so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now, in a sense, you could say, hey, come on, isn't Paul sort of cheating? I mean, how can he use Jesus as the example for giving? Jesus is the Son of God. We're just a bunch of sinners here. I mean, what basis would there be for thinking that we can be like Jesus? Well, we're not like Jesus. But Jesus did something that we can replicate. Jesus came from where? He came from heaven, the riches of heaven. I mean, it's a nice place from everything I understand. But God said, in a nice way, I'm sure, you're out of here. Go to earth, make that sacrifice that is necessary for me to be reconciled to those sinful people living down there. And so that's exactly what Jesus did. He became poor, not just poor in the sense of a blue-collar worker. He was poor because of what he left and what he had to come to. And yet that was God's plan, and that was the example to us that we should be willing to leave what might attract us and what may, might be nice for us for the sake of giving. Again, I'm not suggesting that when you give, then, okay, it's an oath of poverty. No, that's not what we're talking about. But if you are following the example of Jesus in your giving, then you're going to be sensitive to the fact that you need to be free of your financial connections and temptations, and you need to be willing to give yourself for whatever God wants, including your money. Now, it was right away in the beginning, you probably missed it, but the title of this sermon is Below or Beyond 10%. Why would I call it that? Because when a typical Christian thinks of giving, they think, well, I think God wants 10%. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details about what 10% actually means, but what I like about 10% is that we can all do the math, right? Just move the decimal place one point. You got it. That's what 10% is. And the question is, well, does God expect everybody to give 10%? Is he, you know, up there kind of pounding his fist and, you know, got a little list over here. These people are tithers, big long list over here. These guys aren't tithers. I'm going to have something to say to them when they get to heaven. No, it's, it's not like that. Not like that. And verse 12 specifically says, give according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. So if any of you are like desperate to get away from the tithing obligation, here's your out. Okay, here it is. It says, give according to what you have, not according to what you don't have. So if you're making $50,000 a year, which maybe somebody here is, that's not a great income for living in this area. Well, living off 90% of that, that's really hard. But if you're making $200,000 a year, which I imagine some of you are, well, living off 90% of that, that's not too hard. The point is that God wants to make your commitment to giving a spiritual decision. It shouldn't just be sort of a flippant or impulsive movement where, eh, you know, I'll give a hundred bucks this week and well, I got a raise. I guess I'll give 500 bucks next week or I had, a, I just lost that deal. I'm not giving anything this week. No, it's not that way. He wants our giving to be specifically submitted to the direction of the Holy Spirit. This thing is, this one, I, a lot of times I quote somebody else, most of the Bible, but uh, here's one that I made up. Living for God without giving to God is both a two-faced and a boring life. You want a boring life? Be tight with your money. Be tight with your money. Just hang on to it and be bored. Christine and I, thankfully, we haven't had that attitude. And all I can tell you is that we have had so much fun out of giving. Now, I know I'm really serious, and you think, well, how does Doug ever have fun? Well, 
Thanks. That would get the applause. One of the ways I have fun is giving money away. I can remember one time this missionary used to having dinner with us. This is way before I was a missions pastor. And uh, we had a couple of small kids at home, the usual expenses of a young family. And this guy just in passing said, you know, I owe $400 to the IRS, and I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to pay for it. So this is like in a dinner conversation, and we didn't discuss it any further, and he just sort of said this. And afterwards, Christine and I looked at ourselves and said, $400? For $400, you can get out from under the thumb of the IRS? Give him the money. So that's what we did. And you know what the guy said? He said, oh, thanks, I, I, I'll accept your gift, but please believe me, I was just sharing that with you because I was sure of all the people that I know, you guys would never be able to actually help me. <laughs> what a great memory. I still remember it decades later. That's sort of the fun of giving. And then Paul closes off this uh, section in verse 15 by saying, He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. What's that all about? It's a reference to the Israelites when they're in the wilderness. Remember how they got the food? What was it? It was manna, right? Manna. So every morning, this manna would show up. Well, the young and the strong, they'd get out there, they'd gather all this manna and throw it in these big baskets. But then there were old people, maybe even disabled people. They couldn't even, like, get out of bed. They could barely scrape a couple of pieces of manna you know, into, a, into a, their hands. But the way the system worked was that all those manna resources were shared. So everybody got what they needed. So why is Paul bringing this up in, to, the, to the Corinthians? Well, it was to communicate the idea that if you're truly committed to following the Lord, as he said earlier, and if you're giving the way that God wants you to give, then everyone's needs in the body is going to be met. You're not going to starve because, oh, I gave too much this week. It's not the way it works. God is going to take care of your needs. He's not going to necessarily make you rich, okay? I just want to make sure I wanted to get this in somewhere during this message. This is not like, hey, have faith, believe, get rich. I know there are people who stand up, not in this pulpit, but other places, and they say that, but just... Take it from me, it's a lie, okay? There's just not much scripture to support that. So we are not talking about give so you can be rich. We're talking about give so you can respond to the will of God in your life. Give so you can reflect the conviction that you have to be committed to the Lord. That's the motivation for giving. So here's the big question. What percentage should you give to the Lord? I've already told you it might be 10%. Might be less, might be more. I, you know, I can't say specifically. But you do need to make a decision. How much are you going to give to the Lord? So, like, this is a real, a real Doug story. Before I was married, I was already, like, you know, tithing and all that stuff. Like I said, age 15, I was, you know, plunking down five bucks a week. And it didn't stop there, because then actually I started getting some real jobs and all so I was already on this track of giving, and I thought it was great. So I was really interested in this girl, who her name was Christine. And I'm starting to think about marriage. I'm thinking, you know, this is something we probably ought to talk about before we get married. What is our approach going to be to giving? Now, I'm sure all of you are thinking, oh, yeah, that sounds like Doug. Let's forget about dinner and a movie on a Saturday night. Let's stay home and talk about tithing. Well, didn't happen exactly that way. But we did enter our marriage in a joint commitment to giving a certain percentage. Again, I, it was more than a tithe. I don't remember exactly what it was. But the point is, we had made that spiritual decision about giving. And it's, it's blessed us our entire lives. I mean, we've been, we've been to all the phases. You know, we adopted three kids, and then the three kids went to school, and then they went to college, and then they got married. And, you know, we're involved with all that stuff that all of you guys are involved with if, if you are blessed with marriage and if you have children. So with all of those circumstances, our relationship to giving 
has been dynamic. It has not been static. Okay, we didn't say, well, we're going to give X percent, you know, on uh, June 10th, 1967, when we got married, and that's where it sat. No, our circumstances have changed. Sometimes it was kind of scary to give, especially when we had two kids in college for a while. Other times it was easier. And then of all things, the craziest is that last year was one of our lowest income years in terms of what we earned ever, because like that's what retired is being like. I hate to break that to you in case you're wondering about what happens after 65 or 70. But, you know, we weren't earning a lot of money last year. And yet God just did this crazy thing. And we gave more money, a higher percentage of money, than we ever have before. How did that happen? Why didn't it happen in our 50s, you know, when the kids are out of the house and we're at our top earning potential? All those pieces are in place. It didn't happen then. I mean, we, we were responsible in our 50s, but we had better opportunities in our 70s. What's up with that? Well, what's up with it is that God can't be outgiven. And, you know, I, you've heard that before, and maybe that just sounds old, trite, and hackneyed, but that just happens to be the truth. And what I want, I want you to give this a shot. I don't want to just come up here and give a sermon and point out these verses and say, come on, get with it. And then, okay, we check the box. We heard the sermon. Let's go home and try to forget about it. No, I would love for you to have this experience because some of you do need to see God working in your life. Some of you are at a point of discouragement about Christianity. Yeah, you believe it's true, but you're not terribly enthused about it at the moment because ugh, this happened. That happened. I don't know what it is, but I know what life is. And I know my own faith goes through those up and downs as we encounter difficult circumstances. The point is, if you want to build another block in your faith, if you want to have something else to stand on in your faith, start giving. As the Holy Spirit leads you, and with a spirit of openness, and a spirit of generosity. So, I don't know where you are at, at this point. Maybe you checked out, you know, as soon as you heard money, you know, I'll listen to a few of the Doug stories, but that's, that's it. I'm going to finish with an idea about giving that, as far as I know, I never heard it before in a sermon, so I'm giving it a shot now. And I want to promote stewardship solidarity. Stewardship solidarity, what in the world am I talking about? Well, solidarity, I'll, I'll read the uh, definition for you here. Solidarity is a harmony of interests and responsibilities among individuals in a group, especially manifested in unanimous support for collective action for something like stewardship. The idea is you might hear about stewardship, and you just think about how messed up it is in your life, or how you tried it once and ugh, it didn't work. And so you're still pretty, or very, guarded when it comes to this idea. The fact of the matter is, you might benefit from receiving some community help. I don't mean somebody's going to give you a check so that you can give that check to, you know, into the offering. That, that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is that we are what? We are a tight-knit family. That's one of our five priorities. And it's one that we seem to live out pretty well. I mean, you guys seem to like each other. That's good. You hang around for a long time after the services. That's wonderful. Well, maybe, just maybe, some of us can help the others out with stewardship. Now, this isn't just some idea that I came up with. This actually happened in the Old Testament, in a story that you probably hardly even know. This is about a guy named Nabal. Everybody raise your hand. How many songs have you sung about Nabal in Sunday school? None, because he was a jerk. And then there's Abigail. Abigail. Well, we don't sing too many songs about her, but we should. Because she was beautiful, she was wise, and the only mistake she ever made 
was that she got married to Nabal. So, David's in the picture too. This is before he was a king. He had a bunch of guys that he oversaw. They were his mighty men. And David sent some of his mighty men to protect Nabal's workers. It was sheep shearing time. Okay, it was harvest time. This was the time when the money was going to come in because the wool was finally off the sheep and in the market. So it was customary in that day that while this harvesting work took place, that there would be guards. There would be people who would make sure that nobody came and stole the wool and, you know, there were other mishaps. And this was done without a contract. This was done without a wage. It was just something that was done. But it was understood, if that was the situation, that those folks providing the protection, they were going to get some kind of gratuity, some kind of tip. Food, you know, some, some clothing. They were going to get something for their volunteer efforts. And if that sounds a little weird, just take my word for it. It's just like going out to dinner on a Saturday night and tipping the server. You're, of course you tip the server. That's part of going out, right? That's what you do. And in this day, if you had sheep shearers and they needed protection and somebody gave them protection, then you gave them a tip. You gave them some sort of gratuity. But you know what Nabal said? When somebody brought up, hey, uh, these workers, they're kind of, uh, these protection people, they're kind of expecting some money or something. Nabal said, are you kidding me? Who are they with? David? <laughs> David. What do I have to do with David? So Nabal did nothing. Nabal didn't do a thing. And the word got back to David. So what did David do? He starts to strap up. He tells his guys, get your swords. Get your camels. We're going to teach Nabal a lesson. Well, somehow Abigail hears about this. Again, she's the wife of Nabal. Nabal's a lousy steward. Abigail's a good steward. So she gathers up a bunch of food and throws it on the back of some camels, hightails it over to David's camp. She says, David, 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 please, hear me out. First of all, here's as much as your workers could have possibly expected in the way of food and gifts. Here, just take it, take it. And remember these two things. For one, Nabal may be kind of a jerk, but you shouldn't kill him. Nabal doesn't want to die. I'm his wife. I don't want to be a widow. And David, you're on your way up. You're probably going to be king someday. You really want this on your resume that you impulsively strapped up and took out Nabal and his the other people that work with him? You don't want to do that. So indeed, that's what David listened to, and he says in 1 Samuel 25, David accepted from Abigail's hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, go home in peace. See, I've heard your words, and I have granted your request. Request that he wouldn't attack Nabal. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is, here's a married couple the guy's a bad steward. The woman's a good steward. There was solidarity there. And Abigail did what she could to cover for her husband, and it worked. If you're married, and you're both Christians professing to follow the Lord, I hope you're providing stewardship solidarity. Maybe for one, it's a real struggle. Or for the other, I hope you'll just step up and Give some direction and leadership. If you're single, maybe there's a friend that can help you out. You know, there are, there are men and women in this church who would be glad to talk with you about stewardship on a completely confidential basis because we want stewardship solidarity here. We want to help each other out. It's another way of being a tight-knit family. And nobody has to know and and, you know, the details are going to be just between you and an individual who can be trusted. But maybe, maybe you need that kind of stewardship, solidarity. Your community 
can help you if you're willing to admit the need. It's as simple as that. So I don't know exactly where you are, of course, in your stewardship. Valley's policy is completely confidential. We don't know who gives, how much, how much is given. All we know is we want to serve everybody who's here. We want to be the body of Christ for every person who makes themselves part of this congregation. And we are here for you. And we don't say, oh, they've only been here a month. Well, we'll give them the, you know, the C-minus treatment. No, we don't do that. Because that's not the way the body of Christ works. But what we want to do is be a help to you and to be a source of direction and comfort when it comes to stewardship. I'm going to wrap up with a verse, and I just found it yesterday, and frankly, this is an indication to me that I'm actually saying what God wants me to say because he's like coaching me all the way through. I started on this message like way over a month ago. But yesterday morning, I came across this verse. It's in Proverbs. So again, remember, Proverbs are not promises. They're not absolute statements. So don't take this further than it should go. But they are wise phrases. And Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous will prosper, and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Now, I've already said that don't take the prospering thing too seriously, all right? Because there's just a whole lot of other verses that put some conditions on that. But latch on to this one. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Christine and I, we've been refreshed our entire lives because we've been givers. And we were refreshed in a new way last, what was it, two months ago now in December when we found out we had money that we could give away that we didn't know we had. And so we gave it away. What a refreshing experience. Isn't that what you want your Christian life to be? Refreshing? Not stale, not stayed, not discouraged. I know we, you know, we all get into those ruts now and then. But honestly, if you'll be regular and committed, reflecting your dedication to God in the way that you give, you will receive refreshment over and over again.